谢谢发言人衷心设计者提问是关于委内瑞拉的。那么据报道，在挪威沃。A question on Venezuela. According to reports under the mediation of Norway, the Venezuelan government and opposition resumed their dialogue in Mexico City on the 26th and reached common understandings on improving social、uh, life and、uh, people's livelihood. Countries including the U.S., the EU, the U.K., and Canada welcomed this in their joint statement and urged both sides to reach a comprehensive agreement through dialogue. And、uh, would reconsider sanctions on Venezuela if dialogue reach substantial progress. What is your comment on that? China welcomes the resumption of dialogue between the government and the opposition in Venezuela. We hope both sides can meet each other halfway and reach a political settlement at an early date. Our position on the Venezuelan issue is consistent and clear. We always firmly defend the UN Charter and the basic norms of international relations. We always believe that the Venezuelan issue should be resolved through dialogue and consultation by the Venezuelan people under the framework of the Constitution and the law. China commends and supports the efforts of relevant countries for peace talks, and、uh, would like to continue to play a constructive role. On this issue, at the same time, China reiterates its opposition to interference in other countries' internal affairs, unilateral sanctions, the so-called arm jurisdiction, and all kinds of political bullying. Facts have proven that sanctions and pressuring win no support, but would only add more difficulties to the economy and livelihood in Venezuela. We call on relevant countries. To stop interfering in Venezuela's internal affairs and remove unilateral sanctions at an early date, and instead contribute more positive energy to Venezuela's peace, stability, and development. Next question, please. Hi, a question from AFP. The remarks from the British side are a serious distortion of the facts. And constitute grave interference in China's internal affairs. We are firmly against this. Yesterday, I have shared with you what we have learned from the authorities in Shanghai. On the night of November the 27th, to maintain public order, local police in Shanghai persuaded people who had gathered at the crossroads to leave. One of those at the scene is a resident journalist from the BBC. Though the police made it clear to the journalist and others that they needed to leave, the journalist refused to go. And in the entire time, did not identify himself as a journalist. The police. Then took him away from the scene. After verifying his identity and informing him of the pertinent laws and regulations, the police let him leave. Everything was conducted within legal procedures. The, this BBC journalist refused to cooperate. With the police's law enforcement efforts, and then acted as if he were a victim. The BBC immediately twisted the story and massively propagated the narrative that its journalist had been arrested and beaten by police while he was working, simply to try to paint China as the guilty party. This is all too familiar as part of the BBC's distasteful, distasteful playbook.
while having the right to report news in accordance with the law in China, foreign journalists need to cautiously follow Chinese laws and regulations. When conducting reporting and interviews, journalists need to present their press credentials first and not engage in activities incompatible with their capacity as journalists. This applies to all media organizations and is not about freedom of the press. Many foreign media organizations have presence in China. How come the BBC is always involved in troubles at the scene? This is a question that requires some serious thinking. I also have some questions for the UK. First, how does the British government handle domestic protesters? In 2020, the UK police arrested more than 150, 100, oh, 150 people when Londoners took to the street to protest against COVID lockdown. In 2021, the UK police arrested more than 200 people in large-scale demonstrations triggered by the government's public expenditure cuts. Publicly available videos show that UK police officers ruthlessly kicked and beat one unarmed protester and did not stop even when the protester was left exposed in little clothing and was crying and begging for mercy. Second, how does the British government treat journalists? You probably recall that a few years ago, a Chinese journalist was repeatedly hampered and even physically assaulted and eventually convicted by a British court only because she had exercised her legitimate right as a journalist and raised a question to express her opinions at the fringe event of the Conservative Party's conference. Graham Phillips, a UK journalist, became the first British citizen placed on the country's sanctions list only because he had created media content not to the liking of the West. Third, how does the BBC report China? From applying a gloomy filter to painting China in a negative light to distorted reports on Xinjiang and Hong Kong, many people still remember well the BBC's disreputable history of smearing and attacking China. Since 2019, the BBC has been neglecting the Hong Kong rioters' violent behaviors and accusing Hong Kong police of brutality and allegedly bringing more violent protests. On Xinjiang, based only on several non-photorealistic satellite images and reports written by anti-China elements, BBC journalists stationed in Beijing propagated lies of the century to slander Xinjiang. On the COVID pandemic, the BBC even used a counter-terrorism drill video as proof of China's so-called violence in epidemic prevention. Why did the BBC always show up on those scenes? Is the job of BBC journalists to report news or fabricate news? The UK must respect facts, act prudently, and end its hypocritical practice of double standards. Next question, please. Thank you. A question from Prasar Bharti. Hindu 
中方是不是会考虑在这个联合声明中，把马尔代夫还有澳大利亚的名字给删去？因为双方都否认了有参加过这个活动。我昨天呃在记者会上。I must say you are、uh, really serious about your job. Yesterday at the press conference, I referred you to competent authorities in China. And after the press conference, my colleague has shared with you the contact of the department, and I would refer you to the、uh, authorities for the specifics. Next one, please. 湖北广电记者提问：据报道，世界银行前经济学家瓦吉拉接受采访的时候。湖北 Media Group, according to reports, former World Bank economist. Wanga Wajira said in an interview that the sustained growth of China's economy has added dynamism to the world economy, and China stands on the right side of history. He also expressed confidence in the broad prospect of China's high-quality development, which he said will bring more confidence and opportunities for the global economic recovery. What's your comment? Over the past year, over the past decade or so, China's economy grew at an ever Average annual rate of 6.6 percent, and contributed up to more than 30 percent on average to world economic growth. In 2021, China's GDP accounted for 80.5 percent of the world's total, and its foreign trade hit 6.9 trillion dollars. China remains the world's second largest economy and largest trading nation. In the face of complex and challenging situation, both at home and abroad, the fundamentals sustaining China's steady and sound economic growth in the long run remain unchanged, and China remains a source of driving force for global prosperity and development. In his remarks at the 29th APEC Economic Leaders Meeting, President Xi Jinping noted that history has proven time and again that only openness, inclusiveness, and willing cooperation is the right way forward for humanity. China has always been an advocate and champion of an open world economy. We have advanced the high-quality Belt and Road cooperation, put forward the Global Development Initiative, and ensured its effective implementation. Forged closer economic bonds among countries, shared China's development opportunities, and contributed to the implementation of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Openness is vital for development and progress. China will continue to advance a broader agenda of opening up across more areas and in greater depth. Follow the path of Chinese modernization, put in place systems for a higher standard, open economy, and continue to be a driving force for global economic recovery and growth. 总台中国之声记者提问：据报 ，According to reports, on November 26th, the head of the Electoral Commission in Equatorial Guinea announced that the incumbent president won the presidential election with 94% of the votes. Do you have any comments? We noted the relevant reports, and we would like to. Congratulate Equatorial Guinea for a successful election and President Obiang Masoga for his re-election. We believe that under the leadership of President Obiang Masoga, Equatorial Guinea will score even greater achievements in its national development. China and Equatorial Guinea. Are good brothers and partners. Our two countries have strong political mutual trust and enjoy excellent growth of bilateral ties. We highly value our ties with Equatorial Guinea and stand ready to continue to work with it to deepen cooperation across the board and elevate our comprehensive cooperative partnership to new heights. Next one, please. Anyone else? 实施的孟加拉 China Daily, according to reports, a ceremony was held recently to mark the completion of the south tube of the Kanapuli Tunnel, built and implemented by Chinese enterprises in Bangladesh. 
It's the first underwater tunnel in Bangladesh and South Asia. What's China's comment? We extend our congratulations on the completion of the south tube of the Kanapuli Tunnel. The completion of this project, an important link of the Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar economic corridor, is yet another major outcome of Belt and Road Cooperation between China and its neighboring countries. This project is of great significance for improving local transportation and the Asian network of roads and uh, for boosting connectivity between Bangladesh and its neighboring countries. With the completion of the tunnel, a car ride between the airport and the industrial park in the port of Chotagon will be slashed from four hours to a mere 20 minutes. Infrastructure the bedrock of connectivity is a priority of Belt and Road Corporation. We are delighted to see that with concerted efforts, one BRI infrastructure project after another have been implemented with inspiring progress. You may have noted the news over the weekend that the Piliasak Bridge in Croatia, built by a Chinese company, has seen the safe passage of over one million cars since its inauguration in July this year. The bridge has indeed become a bridge of cooperation, development, and friendship between China and Croatia. Going forward, China stands ready to work with all sides for better synergy between the Belt and Road Initiative and respective national development strategies and regional cooperation initiatives to jointly advance infrastructure development, achieve greater connectivity on a larger scale, realize win-win results, and deliver benefits to people of all participating countries. Next question, please. Anything else? How can you get it? Uh, regarding the This is a bilateral project, and at the same time, it is under the framework of Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar Economic Corridor. Well, that concludes today's press conference. Thank you for coming.